Welcome to FireSafe Marin's webinar series. My name is Rich Shortall, the FireSafe Marin Executive Coordinator. Thanks to all of you who took the time to respond to our poll. We will update you later on the results and share it as soon as we can. The FireSafe Marin webinar series is created by the members of our educational committee, including representatives of fire agencies, environmental groups, UC Marin master gardeners, and various subject matter experts. The project is funded and supported by the Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority. Before I introduce tonight's presentation, I would like to let you know that we have some several interesting webinars coming up. The May webinar will discuss environmental concerns for fire smart landscaping. The June one will cover evacuation concerns for animals, both large and small. And July will focus on the fire insurance concerns of homeowners. Tonight, we are fortunate to have Faye Mark and Kirby Wilscox, UC Marin Master Gardeners, who are trained volunteers who will share their research-based knowledge and skills of fire smart landscaping best practices. Faye will cover homeowners' actions that they can take to keep their landscape and garden plants alive under the water restrictions that we are about to experience. And then Kirby will walk us through some steps we can take in the five to 30 foot zone around the home to maintain our vegetation so that exit routes are safe in the event of an evacuation. They will be supported by Marin Master Gardeners, Jim Casper and Judy Orsini, who will help provide answers to your questions. Speaking of questions, we strongly encourage all of you to participate tonight by providing questions in writing through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Questions that cannot be addressed during tonight's conversation will be answered and posted on the FireSafe Marin website. We ask that you please keep your questions related to our topic. Tonight's presentation will be recorded and available on the FireSafe Marin YouTube channel, which includes many additional wildfire educational videos. After tonight's presentation, we have a roundtable discussion and there will be an opportunity for you to ask additional questions of our presenters. There will also be a short survey we hope you will be able to take the time to complete. So let me start by introducing University of California, Marin Master Gardener, Faye Mark. Thank you, Rich. Hello, everyone. I'm gonna go ahead and start my presentation. It would probably help if I shared my screen first. There we go. Okay. Having a little, there we go. So thank you for that introduction, Rich, and thank you to all of you who have joined us this evening to learn more about how we can all maintain a healthy and safe landscape under drought and water restrictions. Many of you may not be familiar with the UC Marin Master Gardener organization. We are volunteers trained by the University of California Cooperative Extension and we provide to you, the public, research-based information on home horticulture, pest management, sustainable landscape practices, and tonight, fire smart landscaping. I can't see any of you, but I can imagine as you read this title, heads are shaking left to right. Some of you may have grimacing faces and thoughts of you cannot be serious. We are facing what will be a very long dry summer with possible weather conditions like lightning that could set off another round of fires like those we experienced last year. One of the tenets of a fire smart landscape is to keep your plants well hydrated. But on April 20th, the governing boards of the Marin Municipal Water District, who today is also known as Marin Water, and the North Marin Water both dotted drought. So how do we keep our plants well hydrated to have a fire smart landscape when water is limited? We'll start to answer this question tonight. In the next 15 minutes, I'll provide some tips on how to prioritize plants in your landscape during drought and with water restrictions. 
To keep your landscape fire smart, you may need to sacrifice some plants to save others. I'll also offer some changes you can make to your current gardening practices that will help you optimize your water usage. And then I'll provide some tips on how to retain moisture in your soil to keep your prized plants well hydrated and healthy, which is key to having a fire smart landscape. And then Kirby will focus on immediate actions you can take to maintain your landscape along the exit routes from your home to your vehicle to ensure safe exit during a wildfire evacuation. During a time of drought, you want to prioritize and care for your older mature trees, your younger trees, and your valued plants over those that can be easily replaced at less cost in the future. Trees are particularly valuable, not only because of the time they take to mature, but also in terms of the benefits they offer like visual interest, shade, privacy, noise reduction, wind protection, air quality, carbon sequestration, and wildlife habitat. Mature trees can often survive one season with only one or two deep waterings during now, the spring and the summer, but Given the conditions that we had last year, two seasons without enough water can result in severe drought stress, making them more vulnerable to damage from diseases and insects, which can ultimately lead to death. Younger trees are still developing their root system, so it's important this season to keep the soil moist to ensure their roots continue to develop. But before you start watering, be sure you know what the water requirements are for the tree species because different species require different amounts of water and sometimes no water at all. If you don't know the species, you can email our help desk with photos and they can help identify it and um, can give you some information on how to care for it. For the trees and plants that do require water, we like the motto, water slowly, deeply, to encourage and support root growth deep into the soil. For trees, water at the drip line, which is located at the edge of the canopy, which you can see with the uh, yellow arrows on either side of the canopy. To do this, it's an it's a easy practice to use a soaker hose, and that works well to deeply water your trees, but make sure you set a timer if it's not connected to an irrigation controller. Fruit and nut trees. They need adequate water in their root zones continuously from bloom until harvest to produce a good crop. It's possible to keep your trees alive with limited water, but crop production will probably be greatly reduced and possibly even stop. And vegetables, they can be difficult to maintain during a drought, but with careful planning, it can be done. As a rule of thumb, water is most critical immediately after transplanting, during the first few weeks of development, and during flowering and fruit production. There's a very informative video filmed by the um, University of California Cooperative Extension at Sonoma called How to Grow Vegetables with Less Water. It's also available on our YouTube channel, and I believe that uh, Jim will uh, be able to uh, add that information to our uh, Q&A panel. The focus of the video is on techniques to help your vegetables thrive during restricted water use. Most established shrubs can survive long periods of dry soil. Um, now is a really good time, especially before May 1st, to thoroughly water um, your shrubs and then possibly one to two thorough waterings in the summer keeps most well-established shrubs alive for at least one season. And I want to briefly touch on the point about eliminating plants to minimize competition for water. Um, the, mo the more closely plants are spaced, the greater their density, and this creates competition for water. So while it may seem painful to remove some of your plantings this season, a fire smart strategy is to keep your prized plants well hydrated, well spaced and clean of dead debris, making them more resilient to heat and embers and discouraging flames from hopscotching from one plant to another towards your home. Once you identify the species of the trees and plants you want to save and know their water requirements, 
you'll want to check them frequently for signs of drought, which could include curled leaves that look scorched. How and how much water you provide depends on a variety of factors and conditions. There may be factors like heat retentive surfaces like your home or other buildings on your property or rocks or gravel or a stone pathway. And that all can contribute to moisture loss in the soil and um, those plants will need more water. Areas under trees or shade structures like a home may produce an environment with enough shade that those plants can do fine without extra water. And of course, weather conditions play a role in the rate of water loss in plants. Longer days with more hours of sun exposure, higher air temperatures and increased wind can contribute to more rapid water loss later in the season. I'll talk about soil and how the condition of your soil can retain moisture for your plants in an upcoming slide. Regardless of how you water your trees and plants, early morning is the best time to water since the rate of evaporation from the soil is lower. If you hand water your plants, use a garden hose with a flow meter attached between the hose and shut off nozzle to monitor water usage. These flow meters are very inexpensive and they're um, easily found in, in most hardware stores. <clears throat> An irrigation system and controller can be your friend and will save considerable water, money and time. If you have a drip irrigation system with a controller this year more than any, is time to review your, how your controller is programmed and if your irrigation system is working efficiently. A valuable feature on most controllers is the interval setting that prevents runoff by setting multiple times for the irrigation to turn on and off. So for example, you can water for 10 minutes at six in the morning and then again at seven in the morning for another 10 minutes rather than 20 minutes all at once. This feature is especially effective with clay soil and for slopes, because many of us have properties with landscaping on a slope. Fire moves very quickly on slopes, as you saw in the um, earlier slide. And so keeping your plantings well hydrated, properly spaced and free of dead debris is very important. The Marin Master Gardeners and Marin Water are in partnership to provide homeowners with information and advice on improving irrigation practices to help conserve water. It's called Marin Friendly Garden Walks and tonight Judy is available to answer water conservation questions in the Q&A box. If you have further questions after tonight, you can make an appointment for an hour long garden walk consultation through our website. So Rich, I'm gonna, I'm gonna end the show here for a minute and uh, take some questions that might be coming in. Great, thanks Faye, that was really good. Um, you touched a little bit on vegetable gardens and I know vegetable gardens are very popular. Do you have some further recommendations about what kind of gardening tips we can use if you do wanna try to grow some vegetables in a drought? Uh, sure. Um, there are many vegetables that, that can be planted and the key uh, is, is going to be to look for low water characteristics. So um, for example, there are California native edibles like uh, blue elderberry and golden currant. And then there are other like Mediterranean herbs like um, lavender or oregano, uh, thyme, rosemary, sage. And there's also um, crops that mature quickly um, like in the 50 to 60 day uh, period. And because they need fewer days to mature, they need less irrigation. So some of those crops might be like beans or, or broccoli, uh, carrots, um, chard, uh, kale. The, the list goes on, it's actually pretty broad and um, our viewers can see a full list of vegetables on our website in a section called how to conserve water in the edible garden. Thanks, Faye. You know, we had a couple of questions about the flow meter. I don't think too many people have seen that before. Can you give a little more detail on how that works and what some of the settings might be that you would use for typical irrigation? So um, I think this is a great uh, opportunity for Judy and Kirby perhaps to also add some um, information about this in, in the Q&A box. Um, I do know that they're available through the um, 
through many uh, hardware stores. And basically um, you can monitor the amount of water in terms of gallons that, um, that you're uh, delivering um, into the garden. And using that information will help you to manage the overall household usage of water, um, you know, depending on, on uh, the information that you get from your, your local water district in terms of your, your uh, usage allotment. Great. Well, maybe one last question before we get uh, back to the second part of your presentation, and that is the use of soaker hoses. I mean, certainly that's not something we want to turn on from hours. Is there any sort of basic guidance of how long a soaker hose should be used to water, say, a, a medium-sized tree? Uh, that's a hard question to answer because it really depends on the quality of the soil. And I'll be talking about this um, uh, in the next few slides. Um, you know, if, if the, the soil is coarse and it's not absorbing water uh, readily, it, it may take longer. Um, whereas if the soil is light and fluffy and the water is able to be absorbed deep down into the root system, which is for, if, if you get anything out of today's lecture, it is, you gotta get that water down into the roots. So um, my recommendation would be to, um, again, figure out what your water allotment is <clears throat> for your household and then um, place the soaker hose around the, the tree and, and observe it and, and get a sense for how quickly, and you can set a timer for this, how quickly is that water being absorbed down into the soil? And you may want to bring in some amendments. And again, I'll get into this into the presentation. Great, thanks, Faye. I think it kind of brings out the point that, um, that there's some of these questions do not have simple answers. And that's why people become master gardeners because a lot of this takes experience and training and everybody's backyard's a little bit different and everybody's plant selection is a little different. Anyway, let's give Faye a chance to get uh, back to our presentation. Okay, let me see where I left off here. Okay. All right, so as I promised, how to top dress your soil. So these two points are ways that you can reduce your water usage in the garden. You can add mulch and eliminate weeds and um, along with those weeds, invasive plants. Um, as I said in, in talking to Rich, the goal is to retain the water in the soil so your plants remain hydrated. Um, adding mulch around your plants and trees moderates soil temperature, significantly reduces the rate of water loss and helps to prevent weed growth, which can compete with your plants for water. Since wood mulch is combustible, you don't want to use it within five feet of the perimeter of any structure on your property because it can ignite and spread fire towards those structures and under the siding of those structures. Alternative mulches include compost, rocks, or gravel. And frankly, I, I really like compost and that's what I use in my garden. I use it to loosen the soil structure. As I said earlier, when the soil is coarse and chunky, it doesn't absorb water efficiently or allow it to filter down to the roots. To have a fire smart landscape during drought, having soil that has a light structure like what you see in the photo on the slide is the most efficient way to target water into the roots of the plants so they remain hydrated. Beyond five feet, you can use composted wood chips or medium sized bark nuggets and those can be layered up to two to three inches in depth as you move further away from the home. And eliminating weeds is an essential maintenance task for your garden. You, you cannot believe how much water weeds absorb and this year, more than any year, is the year to eliminate weeds often and before they develop into seeds. A great time to pull your weeds is right after you irrigate when the soil is moist because moist soil makes it easier to pull by hand and to get the entire root of that weed. And one more note I have to say about irrigation and mulch. Ideally, you always want to water beneath the mulch, but first, before you do that, check with an irrigation specialist 
to um, talk about the, the type of tubing and the emitters that you're using because not all tubing and not all emitters are designed to allow mulch to be placed on top um, without them clogging. And things to avoid this season. Well, young plants require frequent irrigation until they're established. And so this year may not be the best year to plant new plants, especially as it begins to heat up. Even young drought tolerant native, California native and Mediterranean plants require moist uh, root zones while they're getting established. And it can take a year or two to, to really get those root zones established depending on the conditions in which they're planted. So if you, if you really, if you're, if you're at the nursery and you really feel like you need to add plants to your garden, especially within the zero to five foot zone around the perimeter of your home, choose smaller native succulents, which require some but less water than other species. Um, so normally our soils provide nutrients for our plants, but we tend to use fertilizer to boost leaf and flower production, but this increase in foliage requires more water. So again, you know, during water restrictions, most mature landscape plants will survive without additional fertilization. And before May 1, stop watering plants you plan to eliminate. And Kirby will talk a little bit more about this. If you have irrigation in the spot where you, where you remove a plant, plug it up. You can always create a new hole for an emitter if you uh, replace those plants in the future. So when you've eliminated your plants that are stressed or too densely planted, you've pulled all of the weeds and removed invasive plants, you've removed dead debris, and spread all of your compost and mulch to keep water from evaporating from the soil, use your broom to clean up and uh, get some exercise. So with that, um, Rich, I'll stop. And again, I'll, um, share, I'll end sharing screen with you if there are any more questions we'd like to answer. <laughs> great, thanks, Faye. Very informative as always, that, that was just great. Um, I know we're kind of frowning on lawns these days, and I get that, but there are still some people who have lawns, and under this drought conditions, I think some of us will be turning off the water to the lawns. Is there any chance they're going to come back if we do that? Uh, sure. You know, most turf grass naturally goes dormant, um, which makes it look, you know, brown and dead during periods of hot, dry weather, but the roots are still alive. Um, and you know, they're, they are ready to resume growth as soon as, you know, the growing conditions improve. So, you know, if you have a pretty resilient lawn, it should be able to go dormant this summer without much harm. Um, there's also, there's another academic paper on lawn care. Um, it's, it's very academic, but if, if people really want to dig down into the details, uh, I, I think it's a, it's a UC a &R paper, and I think uh, Jim may have the URL that and if not uh, we can get that to the viewers um, after the presentation. Great thanks Faye. Um, <clears throat> so with that said uh, one more question that is kind of a tricky one. We all realize that we want to use mulches wherever we can. On hillsides it's hard to get mulches to stay. What are some recommendations for that? Uh, it's interesting just today I was out for my walk and um, I saw a really interesting practice that um, I wanted to look into in more detail where people had, th this particular garden had put down netting. It was like a jute uh, type netting uh, and jute fiber netting. And um, they placed their, uh, it was like a forest um, mulch uh, or bark on top of that. And that really looked like it was staying in place really well. What we don't want people to do is add gorilla hair um, to their slope. Um, you can break up the slope with um, uh, rocks. You know, I've seen some really nice um, implementations of just a couple layers of rocks, which um, will help to hold the soil back. Great, good answer. Um, here's actually kind of an interesting question. As we know, and we've been talking about this all year long, there's a big focus now in the fire prevention world on the so-called zone zero or the first five feet around the home. 
I think everybody has been learning that the ember showers, which really caused the homes to be destroyed, the way they function is they come up, they hit the home, they fall in that area, and they ignite flammable material that's in that, uh, been kept in that area. So we're recommending that we not have anything that obviously can up for, in a simplistic way, can easily catch fire there. There are some people this summer who may plan to take that seriously and remove a lot of vegetation from that area that does qualify as truly overgrown and so forth. If they do that, what would be the recommendations given that it's a drought year on possible replantings or other ideas of what you can do with that space? So, as I mentioned in the slide, I, you know, the, 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 the thing you really want to focus on in that zero to five, if you do want vegetation, are uh, low growing California native plants or other drought tolerant plants like our um, Mediterranean plants, um, not woody. Um, you want to keep the plants well spaced and you, you want to keep them high, well hydrated. So again, if there, you have the, the viewers, we all need to make priorities you know, in terms of what we're going to keep watering uh, this summer. Um, I really would focus on um, not adding plantings necessarily this summer, but really focus, you know, that water on, you know, the, the, the trees that are beyond the five foot space. Um, I do like compost. And it's a great way to feed the soil within that zero to five foot space. Um, and then, there are uh, California native succulents um, that are, are fun. They're, um, they come in different textures and, and colors and, and um, you know, they do well in, in that space as well. And they're, they're very drought tolerant. Great. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I think at this point, we're gonna move on and bring on Kirby. Thank you very much. That was really helpful. We will join, rejoin later. There was one question that was asking about one of the, some of the information that was on the, one of the slides that Faye put up there. I just really wanna remind all the audience that this uh, webinar can be reviewed on the FireSafe Marin YouTube channel, or if you go to our website, there'll be a link there that will take you to the webinar. So anything you think you might've missed, you'll still be able to catch it there. We also break those uh, segments down into smaller ones so you can kind of easily navigate your way through the various parts of the webinar. Okay, with that said, I would like to bring on Kirby Wilcox. Kirby, thanks so much for coming here tonight and uh, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Rich. Let me tee this up. There we go. So good evening, everyone. This segment of uh, tonight's webinar looks at another facet of fire smart, smart gardening in a drought year. Typically, uh, we think of the Marin County Defensible Space Rules as focused on ensuring that the fire department has access to your home and can protect it from an advancing fire. But we're gonna talk about a twist. We're gonna make use of those same rules but we're going to apply them to another landscape uh, maintenance priority. And that is your safe escape from your home to your vehicle. Our objective is to make sure that you know how to evaluate all the plants along each escape route and how to make any necessary changes. We'll stress the spacing between your landscape plants as uh, Faye has already mentioned and the amount of dense and dry fuel within each of them. We're gonna go through four steps. We're gonna identify the escape routes to your vehicle. We're gonna assess the health and condition of the plants along each route. We're gonna apply the defensible space guidelines that both Rich and Faye have introduced. And we're gonna talk about a favorite Marin Master Gardener mantra, maintenance, maintenance, maintenance. So our hope is that tonight, while it's still light, or tomorrow you'll feel motivated and qualified uh, to perform all of these tasks. So what's the, what's the concern? Let's, let's set up um, a scenario. Unfortunately, it's not fanciful. 
This has happened to thousands of homeowners in Northern California in just the past few years. It's after midnight, you're asleep, you wake to the sound of embers hitting your roof, you look outside and see fire approaching, you need to get to your vehicle and leave. If your vehicle is in an attached garage, you'll likely have no trouble whatsoever. And I should say here, if your vehicle is in an attached garage and you're leaving, make sure you close that door because it's a, bar it's a barrier to flames um, that might otherwise get into your garage. So if however, your vehicle is in the driveway or it's in an attached garage or in the street, you may have to escape along some walkway or pathway or some densely vegetated um, area of your property that could potentially be on fire. So to give this possibility some context, imagine that this is your home. Um, or if you have a detached garage, imagine that this little shed uh, is the garage. So notice how dense the landscaping is around this home. Uh, if you come out the front door and you don't have an attached garage, the shed in this instance would be your detached garage, then your car could be in the driveway, it could be out on the street here, or it could be in this uh, detached garage. Let's look a little further. Although the landscape in this image is not as densely vegetated as in the previous image, it makes the point. You could wake up to an ember storm. And in that case, some of your escape routes already could be difficult to use. So again, for example, if this shed is your detached garage and you typically approached it from the back door across the deck, that option most likely would be unavailable. In this image, the embers are concentrating on that side of the house. Or you could wake up to a fire almost up against your home. Obviously then in this image, any escape out the back is foreclosed. So with these concerns in mind, let's address and resolve them. And it's just not difficult. We're gonna go through each of the four steps that, that were referenced earlier, and we're going to ensure your safe passage from your home to your vehicle. So how are you gonna do this? You, in step one here, you're literally gonna walk entirely around your home and you're gonna identify all the routes that you might follow. You're gonna include exit doors or ex exiting through windows. And you're gonna to wanna to follow those routes all the way to places where your vehicle might be. This is for the homeowner who does not have an attached garage. Again, if the car is in that garage, the, a safe escape is very likely. But if it's outdoors, then you're gonna to have to make sure that all of the steps you would take to get from your home to the places where your vehicle are, are cleared of dense flammable vegetation. It's a good idea to create a map of your escape routes and to make sure that everyone who's in the home um, is familiar with them too. And, and I should use this slide. It's a, it's a good place to mention that if you find yourself subject to a red flag warning, then the best advice is to make sure that your vehicle is gassed up um, and that you have faced it towards the street and that you've parked it in some place where it will be the most accessible to you. So now that we have the routes identified, let's ass assess all the plants along the route. You wanna note their health. Are they well hydrated? Do they show signs of drought stress? These are issues that Faye has mentioned. Faye's also mentioned uh, their spacing. How close are they horizontally? Are they touching? How close are they to plants uh, above? Could a flame from below ignite a vegetation above? And then you also wanna note their individual density. A, a single plant 
could contain a lot of dead branches. And you also don't want to forget to look under the plant. Are there dead leaves? Are there twigs? And uh, Faye and I are a broken record on the point of using mulch. Um, is the surface of the soil beneath that plant, those plants covered with mulch? Again, you don't want to use wood bark mulch in the zero to five foot zone. You want to use compost um, or some other flammable, non-flammable material. And then finally, you want to note how far those plants are from your home or other structure along each route because the defensible space guidelines or recommendations are based on that distance. You can see from this slide a depiction of the zones, zero to five feet closest to the home, the five to 30 feet, and then beyond 30 feet to 100. The purpose for this slide is to show you that depending on your home, you could find that the five to 30 foot space and certainly the 30 to 100 foot space extends to your neighbor's property. Therefore, cleaning up your escape routes may require that you get together and work out a plan to address each of your needs, that is your needs and the needs of your neighbor. Zone zero is the most restrictive. Currently, the recommendation is no vegetation in this area and no tree branches that extend into this area. But it's important that you should know that this recommendation is changing and you should check with your local to fire, fire department. The recommendations seem to be evolving to the point where it may be permitted to allow within the zero to five foot zone, low growing, well hydrated, non woody plants combined with non combustible mulch, such as compost, gravel or stones. This is also a good time to mention that um, all wood bark mulch, including both three quarter inch bark mulch and gorilla hair is combustible. Faye mentioned this, but we can't overstress it. Wood bark mulch of any kind should not be used in zone zero. Finally, you want to uh, remove debris from the corners and where the walls meet the ground. And if you look at that, there's a possibility that flame could get underneath and behind the siding and create um, a fire behind the exterior wall. In zone one, the recommendation regarding wood bark mulch is not to avoid it altogether, but to avoid shredded bark mulch. Again, gorilla hair. Um, but I should accent that because all wood bark mulch is combustible, homeowners should be aware of that combustibility and decide whether to use it even in zone one. If you do use wood bark mulch in this zone, one way to, result, to reduce the fire risk is to break up the mulched areas with hardscape, um, like gravel, um, brick, or decomposed granite. And then again, you want to focus on the distancing between the plants and you want to limb up branches six to 10 feet or one third of their height. Zone two uh, is the furthest out, 30 to 70 feet. Here, the focus is on horizontal and vertical spacing so that the fire doesn't spread sideways or jump into tree branches above bushes and grasses. You want to cut grasses to no more than four inches. And again, you want to remove the twig and leaf debris, although currently the recommendation is that you can leave up to three inches of um, mulch material for erosion uh, control. So we've got everything set up. Um, we're ready to apply these defensible space rules, but wait. We want to talk about three myths that deter homeowners from making some of these changes. Myth number one is fire smart landscapes are not beautiful. 
Number two is prized plants are worth everything and you should try to save them. And the last is that these fire smart changes that we're discussing are just too expensive. But none of these is true. So Faye had a number of images. Here's two more. These are fire uh, safe, um, fire smart landscapes, and they're just flat out beautiful. When it comes to um, whether plants um, or people uh, are more important, um, there's a cute little picture here. Let's assume that the plants um, behind this family are in the five foot zone and they're all from Aunt Tilly. So they, this family has an emotional attachment to them, but when the ember fire hits and exit routes to a vehicle are um, barred or compromised because those plants are on fire, um, you're gonna look back and I can tell you which is more important. It's not those plants, it's the two children and the cat and the dog. But we're discussing this now. You have the ability to go out now and make these changes overcoming some of the emotional attachment that you may have to some of your plants. And lastly, on whether defensible space improvements can be expensive, the opposite is true. If you remove a plant, that's not a difficult thing to do. Some plants can just be moved. You can keep them in your um, landscape, but just put them in another spot where they don't pose the same risks. Um, some overgrown plants can be pruned and thinned. If you have replacement plants, keeping in mind Faye's point about the water they use, you can purchase new plants in small containers at little cost. And all of the fixes that we're describing can be performed by the homeowner or by a local gardener. So let's, let's try to make this um, uh, as practical as we can now by looking at some images of some nearby homes and deciding what could be done with them. This is gonna help inform your judgment. So in these two images, we're looking at front doors. In the photo on the left, there's dense vegetation in the zero to five foot zone. All the window exits are blocked and these plants are encroaching on the front door. That front door area could be in flame um, given the proximity of the plants to that door. But it doesn't follow from this that this homeowner has to come in and remove all those plants, certainly not right away. I would recommend that the homeowner have these plants professionally pruned to reduce their size and increase their spacing. Once, that done, well, once that's done, that actually may be sufficient to provide for a safe escape from the front door uh, to a vehicle. In the photo on the right, you can see that it's much less densely vegetated, although there is growth in the five foot zone. Um, embers falling from the sky likely would pass through this Japanese maple on the right. Um, although some thinning is always recommended to make sure that there's not too much fuel in a tree like that. But at the very least, this homeowner should remove the dry wreath on the front door because that's ignitable. And if you can see it, there's prayer flags hanging from the front. Those all th also could catch fire and um, pass embers down right in front of the front door uh, as they might want to leave. Let's look at a secondary escape route. In this home, the picture on the left is coming from a side door and moving out towards the front door. The image on the right is the growth on the left of the left-hand picture. So if we stay in the left-hand picture, there is still growth in the five-foot zone. It's not particularly dense. Um, the real culprit here is the dense vegetation on the left side. So let's look at the right-hand image where we get a better vision of it. Some of these plants are dead and they can simply be removed. And I'll repeat something that uh, Faye mentioned, which is important. If you remove a dead plant and it has an emitter watering it, that emitter should be um, plugged. The remaining plants are just too close, but this 
landscape doesn't have to be decimated. Some of those plants should be removed. Um, some of them could be planted elsewhere in the garden um, so they'd be preserved. And those that remain on this um, shallow slope should be pruned um, to thin them out and to remove their thick thatch of fuel. And again, looking underneath and pulling out any debris and leaves that might also catch fire. Let's look at one last image. This is a pathway to a detached garage. The gravel, the gravel path is great, but look at that plant on the left. It contains a lot of dead material for the entire length of the path. That thatch of dead material should be removed. And you can't quite see it in this image, but it's a great place to raise another uh, point. Look up when you're reviewing your escape routes. There may be dry material overhead on an arbor or, or just over a gate, and that dry material may also need to be removed. We could go further with other images, but I'm gonna halt at this point because the goal was to give you a sense of what you're looking for and what you're trying to do in each zone, what you're trying to accomplish. Um, this is a good place to break and to take any questions. Great, well, thanks very much, Kirby. And I do wanna thank Kirby because when he first came to us, this is really was a different approach that he suggested to our problem that we honestly haven't exactly considered before. So that was great and very informative. And I hope that was helpful to all the audience. Sort of related to that, and you and I talked a little bit about this when we were going over the rehearsal for this presentation. There is some determinations we all have to make about tolerance for risk. So you and I, for example, were talking about that Japanese maple tree. And it's an attractive tree. I have several on my property. I have one that's situated almost exactly like that. It's up near a roof line and so forth there. Um, do we need to cut that tree down? Or is this something we can work through and we make a determination of living with that risk? Rich, it's the latter. I, I think you can maintain that tree in its location, even though technically it's not consistent with the recommendation to remove vegetation in that area. Because if you keep the height down so that it's away from the eaves where any flame could catch the roof on fire, and you keep it thin the way it was, then the ember fire should pass through and fall to the ground. I feel that that homeowner, if that tree is maintained, I go back to my maintenance, 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 could keep it, which is why I mentioned that I think then the best thing to do is just make sure that the door doesn't have the dry wreath on it and that the prayer flags are removed. Great. I'm of the same mindset, Kirby, so thanks. <laughs> it makes me feel better about my own trees. I'm going to keep them. Uh, sort of related to that, which is maybe a little bit more of a problem, are hedges. Um, some hedges are placed in a way they're farther away from the home and they're right next to it and whatnot. But a lot of people have sort of hedges in the foundation planting world. And how can you really maintain a hedge? Because the inside of them is really quite dry. So this is a really good and important question. And I'm gonna say one thing right up front. Most people shear hedges. That's not universally true, but most people do because it's inexpensive, either with you know just shears or they bring an electric clipper through and they shape it all. The problem with that is shearing actually increases the density of the plant. It doesn't make it less dense. It makes it more dense because you're knocking off all the little buds at the top and all the buds beneath go crazy because the top bud has been removed. The best way to maintain a hedge is to keep it thinned a bit, to reach down into the hedge with pruning shears and remove branches that crowd the hedge. Having said that, another answer to your question is, to consider, I'll say three factors, proximity to the home, the size, uh, and as I mentioned earlier, the condition or health. If the hedge is really close to the house, then I recommend that it be pruned down, especially if it's in or near that five foot zone, zero to five feet, bring it down to 18 inches. 
If it's further away, then it can be much higher. But another pruning trick is to make sure that you don't prune the sides straight up and down or in. The head should be pruned so that it's like a tall, pyra tall triangle with the top cut off. So the sun can reach either side so that the growth on the side remains green uh, and hydrated. And then to your last point, even if you have, if you're pruning it by hand and you're pruning it to the right shape, you wanna be looking inside, opening it up and removing the dead material. Um, in that way, size, uh, proximity to a home and condition, a homeowner should be able to maintain most hedges. That's probably good news. <laughs> <laughs> that is good news. Thanks, Kirby. I got one last question for you. Probably one of the most common things we hear at Fire Safe Moran is my neighbor has this tree and the tree is, needs to be removed because it's a hazard, it's gonna burn my house down. We have provided, we've addressed this in quite a few of our previous webinars. And we really do make the point that the ember showers come in, it's not as if they're igniting the trees right next to your home and then the trees catch your house on fire. It's not that net that that never happens, but that's not the common scenario. Instead, it's more common that the embers themselves fall in the vulnerable places right next to your home or through vents and screens, and the home burns down. At the end, you see a pile of ashes where the home was, and yet you see relatively green trees, which were fairly close to the home, still looking very healthy and well. That said, trees do need to be maintained and pruned properly. And the time of year and how we do that really matters. Could you give us some comments on that? I, I, I can, I mean, that's a great question because the common understanding is that you prune all plants in the winter during a dormant season. But it's more complicated than that, but I'm gonna make it simple. The first thing I'm going to do to make it simple is to say that if you don't write down everything I'm about to say, you can go to the Marin Master Gardener website, go to care and go to pruning, and you'll find all of this timing information. So let me give a, a handful of answers. You never want to prune while a shrub or tree is leafing out or losing its leaves. I won't get into all the biology of that, but there's so much chemical stuff going on that if you complicate the tree's life by cutting off a bunch of limbs and requiring the tree to seal those cuts, it's not going to be happy. So you just don't prune when it's uh, leafing out or losing its leaves. January and February are ideal months to perform big cuts, more than an inch in diameter, on non-native plants. For native plants, um, the best time to prune is um, the end of August through September and October. That's for the big cuts on a native plant. But you can prune in the summer. In July and August, those are actually the best months to make small cuts, uh, to clean up a shrub or a tree, uh, to make it less dense um, with fuel. But I'll mention this last one. Overarching all of this is what master gardeners call the three Ds. You can always remove, no matter what I've said, dead, damaged, or diseased wood from a plant. In fact, it's a good idea to do that. So uh, to sum up, hold the big cuts for the dormant season, smaller cuts for the summer, but make sure the dead and the diseased and the damaged wood is removed. It's just fuel for fire. Great, thanks Kirby. Um, one thing Kirby mentioned, and I really wanna give a big plug for this, the UC Marin Master Gardeners website is just fantastic. And they have a help desk, which is really fantastic. I'm quite proud of the Fire Safe Marin website and it's more focused on a lot of the specific fire related questions, but I refer people all the time to that website and everybody who goes there really is just thrilled with the help that's there. So I do really want to thank Marin Master Gardeners for maintaining that really great website. And please feel free to take advantage of it. It's a great resource. 
So we're near the end of our presentations. I really want to thank Kirby. That was just great. And I want to thank Faye. We'll be bringing them back in just a minute. But we have a couple of takeaways. So that just reminders of some things, that, some actions you can take. Um, Jen, you want to put up that slides? Thank you. So <clears throat> the first one is that we uh, really want to maintain the landscape during the drought and water restrictions. Here's what we need to do. Prioritize, excuse me, prioritize and care for your mature and valuable plants before planting anything new. This is not the new planting time right now. Use mulch to retain moisture in the soil. The type of mulch you use depends on really where it is in the garden. Avoid over fertilizing. This was huge. Faye made a big point out of this. Eliminate the weeds. They're just sucking all that water up. And then adjust your irrigation controllers. Next slide. I think we have one more slide that we're going to show here. Here we go. Um, so this has to do with the landscape maintenance along those exit routes that Kirby was talking about. Um, you want to think ahead of time about this escape routes are for getting to your vehicle. And as we know in Marin here, it's not uncommon that people actually need to leave their vehicle parked out on the street. So think of how you're gonna to get to it if we're under fire conditions. Assess the health and the condition of the plants along the route. Use your defensible space guidelines. And, and I think all the master gardeners will tell you this, all of this is about maintenance, maintenance, maintenance. All right, with all that said, thank you very much. And let's, uh, let's move on to the round table here. We'll bring uh, uh, Faye and Kirby back here. All right, looks like we're all up here, great. Um, so I'm gonna start off with maybe a, a sort of a tricky question here. And that is, um, can, do either Faye or Kirby wanna tell us a little bit about some of the steps that you've had to take in your own garden in preparation for this drought year? <laughs> Who wants to start? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll start, I'll start. Go ahead, Faye. go ahead. So uh, I've actually had um, a pretty drought tolerant garden uh, for quite some time, um, just by luck, frankly. Um, I, knew, I knew about native plants uh, from being a master gardener and um, I, I'm a pretty lazy gardener, frankly, as a master gardener, so I, I wanted, a pretty maintenance-free garden. Um, so maybe I was ahead of my time, I don't know. But um, so I have mostly succulents and native plants um, in my garden with, with just a few ornamentals. Um, now, as Rich and many people in the fire community know, I have black bamboo um, flanking my home. And so I... Um, I have to be vigilant about keeping it maintained. And I work very hard to make sure that there is not a stitch of dead leaves on the ground. Um, I keep the, the bamboo canes very well spaced. My bamboo is not dense at all. It's very um, open. Um, and, and I recognize that, you know, I probably need to eliminate you know, even more than, than what I, I currently have eliminated, but um, it's, uh, it's a lot, it's a lot of work and it's a lot of maintenance. And, um, and I, I think that's probably where I focus the majority of my uh, uh, efforts um, now that I've become much more familiar, um, you know, with fire smart landscaping. Um, and I, I'm not encouraging anyone to plant it by any stretch of the imagination. I think if you have it, if you're not willing to maintain it, you should remove it because it is, um, it's, it's fairly invasive if, you know, depending on the type of bamboo that it is. And it just takes a tremendous amount of maintenance and you have to be really dedicated to keeping it cleaned up. Great, thanks Faye. Glad you brought up the bamboo because it's not one of our favorite plants. 
It's very common. People like it as a privacy screen. And just as you point out, it is really hard to maintain, grows all over the place. And it's just, it's for most people, it's probably more trouble than it's worth. There are better plannings, there are better alternatives that are out there. If you're not sure, talk to the help desk at Marin Master Gardeners and give you some ideas of what you can do with it. How about you, Kirby? How about your backyard? So I did, I took several steps um, because of the, the drought. Um, I removed some plants that I thought I wouldn't be able to maintain and that would be fairly easy to replace next year. I moved some plants away from the five foot zone out into other parts of the garden. And I just put tons of compost on all of the beds. I mean, Faye said it best, but when you put that blanket of compost on top of your garden, you're not only providing sort of a slow release um, hydrogen, I mean, you know, some sort of nutrition for the plants beneath, but that blanket keeps the hot sun from um, overheating the roots and holds that moisture in. It's just marvelous. I turned off the irrigation to some plants and I reduced the times on some plants. And coming back to that uh, little hose end water meter, I put that little water meter at the end of my hose because I wanted to get a, a sense of if I'm gonna do hand watering, which I do, and because I anticipate being under gallon water restrictions or could be, how much water am I actually using when I'm using that hose? So I go out and I go like, whoa, 50 gallons. That, that, that's way too much. Uh, you're just gonna get a sense because I think that, and you could also put it at the end of a hose before the soaker hose so that you could turn it off when you reached a certain number of gallons because, because Faye, said, if you have a mature tree and you want to know how much water it needs, find that out from the UCANR website. And then you can use that little meter to provide that much moisture for that tree. It's just a great, inexpensive little device. That's great. Rich, I, I, I would also add, I did similar to, to Kirby, I completely reset my controller this year. And I, um, you know, one of the questions that came up in the Q&A was, you know, how do you determine if your emitters are leaking or if, if your irrigation is leaking when it's four inches underneath uh, your soil? Frankly, it takes some digging, you know, and um, most of, well, with, with my system, it's, I've got one inch tubes and then I've got, um, you know, drip uh, uh, tubing that comes off of that. And um, it takes a lot, it took a lot of work. So, you know, I, I dug things up, um, kind of once, once you get your hands under a one inch tube, it's pretty easy to follow it um, down the length. But some of us have larger properties where it, it, it can be a lot more challenging. But I, I do think a good place to start is to just completely reset the controller and reprogram it so that it is it is uh, programmed for our current uh, restrictions. You know, sadly, I bet of a lot of us, because we don't do it very often, either have forgotten or actually don't remember how to reset our controllers. Mm. So between us, we should come up with a short uh, video just reminding people, because they're fairly standard, of just how to go about doing that, because that is really an important thing for all of us to know. That's great. Um, <clears throat> Another thing that you mentioned is there's always controversy about plants and plant lists and whatnot. And there's many pros and cons and there's many approaches to planting gardens and viewing that and whatnot. Um, but it always comes up native plants. What are some of the benefits of native plants? Well, my garden is more than half native plants. So it's Ribes and roos and ceanothus and buckeye and hazelnut and, and so forth. So from my perspective, the beauty of natives in a drought year is they're dormant in the summer, right? They grow basically starting, there's exceptions, but they come out of dormancy in November, December, um, that's when they flower and fruit and so forth. 
So literally as the days shorten, they come out of dormancy, but when the days get hotter and longer, um, they go into dormancy. So I like them because they just don't use very much water. And if you take something like a ceanothus, um, you wouldn't want to put very much water on its roots during the summer because you could rot them. So I think one of the values of, of them is particularly important for a year like this. But then I just feel that they are a little less intense to maintain. And I just personally love the fact that they're blooming in the winter. Mm. So that's, to me, that's just a huge plus. Um, I've got toy on um, remote from the property. I mean, just a little further away from the house. So the, all those bushes with red berries at, in, in December is just a lot of fun. Yeah, I, I don't know that I can add that much more other than, you know, it's, it's, um, it's good for our environment. You know, they attract um, mm -hmm. native insects and, and, um, and our, our native insect populations are de declining. And, you know, when you have a decline in your native insect populations, then you have a decline in the ability for birds to feed their young. And, you know, it just, there's the whole um, cycle um, of life, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. um, but I, you know, there's, there's, I think Kirby just said it all about native plants. They, um, they grow well in our climate too. You know, they just, they're like Mediterranean plants. They like our climate. It's, it's, the, it's native, you know, they, they want to live here. So um, they're pretty easy to grow. Great. So speaking of climate and Mediterranean climate, Marin is a little bit complicated. We have different pockets. So you can be on a North Slope in Mill Valley. You got a lot of redwood trees and ferns. You could be in a, one of the flatter spaces out or a drier spaces, the maybe the northern side of Mount Tam and so forth. How do we sort of view all this in terms of trying to make good decisions about plants? There's some guidelines. Well, so, um, you know, one of the, the first things you wanna do is, is understand what climate zone do you live in? And within that climate zone, there's gonna be a microclimate most likely on your property. So um, again, on our website, we have information that, that helps to form, inform for the different areas of Marin County, uh, what climate zone that you live in. And uh, I think Kirby's, there are three climate zones in Marin County, is that right? Yes. So, well, yeah. I, for sure there's three. Yeah, and so, you know, and, that, and that's based on uh, the sunset um, climate zone, and then there's a USDA climate zone. And we, we tend to uh, prefer the, the sunset climate zone because it's more representative of the, um, you know, kind of the intra climates within our community. Um, so I would start there. And, um, and then the other thing I think that's really important is to really understand for your property, um, sun exposure. And, um, you know, where does, how, do, how does the sun affect your landscape? You know, where did, where, what parts of your landscape have full sun versus shade? Um, and, and really try to understand, given that, you know, we've got another motto, right plant, right place. So um, if you understand what the conditions are, where you wanna plant uh, something, then you have a better chance of that, that plant thriving. Um, Kirby, what do you think? Well, I, I, without intending to repeat anything, uh, Faye, I just think that you have nailed it. I'll, I'll only add this. This reference to climate zones is not just a cutesy piece of stray information. Um, my climate zone is one of the colder in Marin. So we had 20 plus days at 25, 26, 27 degrees. So we had some salvia, the ones that are in rosettes, so they're kind of lush, and they didn't die. They blew up. You know how water expands uh, when it freezes? So the salvia became a puddle. Our, our, our goal as master gardeners is to make sure that you pick a plant that is 
good for your microclimate. So, I'm, Rich, I'm glad you mentioned it. Think of your zone as a very important piece of information before you buy any plant, or it may last a few years and then no more. And this point about daylight, it's, en it's enormously important. Marin is full of so many little pockets and so many little valleys. If you have six hours of sunlight a day, you're going to pick plants totally different, totally different from someplace which has 10 plus hours of sunlight a day. And, and I would add to that, um, so I live uh, in the probably the most southern part of Marin County and um, I, I get virtually no frost where I live. So I have aeoniums, you know, and aeoniums are just filled with water. They're huge, they're filled with water. I don't, I don't know this for a fact, but I can't imagine that m the types of aeoniums that I have in my garden would do as well in your garden you know, Kirby, I think they would freeze and, you know, shrivel up because they, they have yeah, so and, much water in them. And that's why I think people should should consider, and the reason why I considered uh, introducing native plants. And, it, and, and it's not like it's out in some chaparral and there's only, you know, a few plants per you know, 100 square feet. It's pretty, you know, it, it's all consistent with the defensible space zones, but there's a lot of variety and a lot of texture. It's great. And, and I would say, you know, as much as I would love for people to go to the Fire Safe Marin website and the, the um, Marin Master Gardener website, California Native Plant Society, uh, the Marin County chapter just published a really terrific uh, Fire Smart landscaping replacement list. Mm. Um, and uh, in fact, I, I shared the link with, with one of the participants tonight, uh, one of the viewers. and. Um, and it, it, it provides a really nice uh, overview of um, everything from trees to, to shrubs to ground covers. They're all native. Um, uh, many, in fact, I think most of them uh, can be purchased through local nurseries because the local chapter worked with local nurseries to, um, to, uh, in, to focus inventory um, to support you know, to, to, so that uh, uh, residents can easily purchase those plants as well. Well, we're getting near the, about getting ready to wrap up, but uh, tell me if I'm wrong about this. I think maybe one advice is, one way you don't want to think about your garden is you don't want to go to Home Depot, see something that looks pretty and bring it home and plant somewhere. You really need to think all of this through. And I, and I think that's what we're learning for all of this and maintenance, maintenance, maintenance. All right, so again, I wanna thank everybody. I know we have a short survey for those that can hang around minutes and do that. We really would appreciate that. Thank you very much. I really wanna thank Faye and Kirby, great presentations and Jim Casper and Judy Orsini who responded to a lot of questions. Uh, some were very complicated. We really appreciate them bringing their expertise onto it tonight. So with that, I do hope we'll see you at our future webinars. And thanks very much for attending. I, I know that was a lot of time on your part and we appreciate it very much. So thank you.